Good morning, everybody. Thanks for your interest in this uh, session about uh, EMC fundamentals. Uh, sorry for the bit de be, uh, small delay. And uh, we are going to uh, talk about fundamentals for EMI and EMC. I am Arturo Mediano from Spain, from the University of Zaragoza. And uh, we have this basic headline for today. We have several good speakers. Uh, now uh, we will have a Lee Hill from Silent Solutions talking about radiated emissions. Uh, then we will have a, a small break, break for, for the coffee. And uh, after the break, we'll have the second part of the uh, Lee Hill uh, presentation, Conducted Emissions. Uh, at uh, 11.15, we will uh, have here to Bruce Archambault talking about PCB design. It's the first uh, key part of our systems to minimize problems in radiated or conducted emissions. Later, we will have grounding and shielding. Grounding will be presented by Tahabin from Clemson University, and uh, uh, shielding will be presented by Andy Marvin, two excellent speakers and professors and EMC experts in these fields. At 3.30, we will have a break, uh, again, 30 minutes. We will continue with cables, again, with Todd Havin, and at the end of the day, I will present uh, 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 talk about filters for EMI and EMC. So, welcome. I hope you will enjoy this presentation. Ali, you can start uh, when you when you want. Break is at uh, ten. Let me open for you. Good morning. Before I get started, um, I learned a long time ago that it's important to know not only what you're going to speak about, but who you are going to speak to. Public speaking 101, as we say in the United States. So I'd like to ask, uh, how many of you are currently working in industry right now full time? Okay. How many of you are, st are students at the university right now? Okay, are some of you students and working in university at the same? <laughs> and uh, how many of you are uh, professors at the university? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'm Lee Hill and I spend most of my time uh, working on new hardware designs, mostly in the United States, uh, helping people design uh, new electronic systems, whether they be uh, medical, consumer, uh, scientific, industrial, once in a while aerospace or military. Um, my business partner and I spend most of our time doing reviews of circuit boards, schematics, cables, connectors, enclosures, everything that it can impact the EMC performance of a complete system. About half my time is spent on doing design reviews about half my time is spent on troubleshooting, actually taking things apart and putting them back together again and, and hoping that it will work after we put it back together again and hoping that the EMI problem is, is better after we've changed the system and put it back together again. Uh, a little bit of the time I spend uh, teaching professional classes and I'm now an adjunct uh, instructor at a university in Massachusetts, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. That's only a small portion of my time. Most of my time, uh, I'm trying to earn a living by uh, working on new product designs, either uh, doing design reviews or troubleshooting. About half of our work is in regulatory things. We're, we're trying to pass what I call the stupid EMI test, something that has nothing to do with the product's functional specification, but is very important either for, is very important for a customer to accept the product 
or is uh, very important to be able to legally ship the product into another country. So about half of our time is spent on regulatory things, and about half, half of my time is spent on functional noise problems, where there is no EMC uh, standard in place, uh, or an EMC standard is not important at the moment. What's important is that the product work okay when, of all, of its, when all of the product's power supplies are turned on, uh, when all of its motor drivers are turned on, while we're trying to measure microvolts or millivolts at the same time. Some of our customers don't care about the stupid EMI test. They just want their product to work okay and to pick up uh, maybe good signals from the human body. Okay? I just wanted to let you know what my background was. Um, I think it's very important when you listen to a speaker in a technical field to understand what their bias is, what they might think because of the nature of their work, and, and also their background. So uh, I hope that uh, you don't mind the, the quick introduction there. That's, that's what I do for a living. Um, so th thanks to Art and uh, Mark Stefka in the United States and a whole bunch of other people who are putting this symposium together, I'm here to talk about radiated conducted emissions. Um, if you are very knowledgeable and competent in this area, hopefully I will give you a little uh, new piece of information that maybe you can use to explain to somebody else. Um, if you're new to the area, I hope that this makes sense to you and, and could be a good introduction without any extra information. So for, let me just tell you what I'm going to talk about, which is radiated emissions. We're going to use a very small bit of math um, to clarify what we mean by, uh, in particular, the, the different noise paths. And then we're going to use, do a little bit of practice using the noise model. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about antennas, um, the tiny bit of antenna theory that would be helpful um, to understand, uh, for example, radiated emissions from electronic products. But of course, if we understand radiated emissions from, a, uh, from an electronic product, we probably also have uh, a good feeling for radiated immunity to that product, because in both cases, I would think that an antenna would be involved. Um, and so we'll talk about what to look for. Um, and then we'll do uh, a very fast drive, drive by, as we say, or drive through with uh, conducted emissions as well. I mean, conducted emissions will focus on the important things like what does the noise current look like when it exits the EUT? If we're going to intelligently troubleshoot a conducted emissions problem, if we're going to intelligently talk to somebody else about a conducted emissions problem, it'd be helpful to understand the nature of the noise currents leaving the system, and that, of course, would help us to either design or modify uh, a filter circuit to help fix that conducted emissions problem. So that would, that would be the motivation to understand how the currents move around. Uh, we'll talk about differential and common motypical causes and solutions. Again, this is a very kind of surface uh, conversation that we're going to have in an hour or so, uh, but I'm going to try to make every uh, slide count. Um, whenever I give a technical talk, questions are welcome at any time. Please don't be polite with me. Be polite with everybody else. Don't be polite with me. Interrupt me any time that you want. Uh, if I've said something that doesn't make sense, if I've said something that is, um, that is in opposition, that, that in opposition to some of your ideas, it doesn't make sense, and you have a different idea, I would love to hear it. Uh, please don't hold your questions until the end. Um, I, along with Arturo, are responsible for making sure that we end on time, so don't worry about your questions changing the timetable. So please, any time that you want, just, just interrupt me as I'm talking. I might not see you raise your hand, so please just shout it out if I'm looking at my notes once in a while to make sure I know where I am. Okay. Um, conducted emissions ought to take a full day. Radiated emissions ought to take a full day. Uh, we could teach a 40-hour university course on both of these things, but we're going to talk about them as if we can cover them in, in an hour and a half or so, so I'll do my best. Okay. That's all the introduction material. Now let's talk about radiated emissions a little bit. Um, the, th the noise model that I was taught when I went to school for electromagnetics and electromagnetic compatibility, something that I was not taught in undergraduate school, um, the basic idea about how to understand or solve any noise problem. If any of you have been to an EMC symposium or technical talk before, I would hope that you would have already heard about the noise model. You would have heard somebody talk about the noise source and the path and the victim. Um, hopefully I'll make that a little bit more fun today. Um, about uh, 25 years ago when I started my business, Silent Solutions, 
there were many, many easy noise problems to find and solve. And that meant I could make a living pretty easily by solving electrical noise problems. 25 years later now, uh, near 2015, um, most of our customers understand where the noise is coming from, often some digital circuit on their PC board, maybe a Class D audio amplifier, maybe a switch mode power supply, maybe a motor drive, maybe, maybe, maybe one of those sources. They have an understanding that this part of the circuit is causing the problem. When I turn it off, the problem goes away. Um, they pr hopefully understand that when they pay money for a radiated emissions test, that the test laboratory provides the receiving antenna or, or the victim, the other end of this path, the, uh, the, the other end of the path. So they've got a source on one side and they've got a victim or an antenna on the other side for a radiated emissions problem. The, the thing that stops our customers from understanding and solving radiated emissions problems is they're a little bit weak on understanding the path. They have different ideas about how does the noise source show up at the victim or show up at the antenna for radiated emissions. They have a little trouble describing that in words. They have a little trouble with the math. So that's what I'm going to focus and that's what I, what I always focus on when I'm talking about uh, radiated emissions. So there's, if I've got a radiated emissions problem, there's got to be a source. Um, some periodic or transient signal with a time-changing voltage and a time-changing current. Can I have a radiated emissions at DC? I, probably not, right? I can't, I've got to have a time-changing current out on the antenna. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the possibility of a DC noise problem in a little bit. Uh, sometimes we, we memorize things like time-changing voltage and time-changing current as a necessary source when really uh, uh, what Ampere and, and, and Maxwell and Faraday had in mind was, was a time-changing field. And, and when we look at electrical circuits that aren't moving, we focus on the, the time-changing current and the voltage because that's easier and, and it's nice because we can draw a schematic to show those. So, okay, so we need a source, we need a path, and then, of course, uh, we need an antenna. Uh, something about our system has to provide a uh, transmitting antenna structure for radiated emission to, to exist. So we're going to go and move on and talk about this now. Um, <clears throat> I have a terrible story that I like to tell every time I talk about the four noise paths, and I hope that you will allow me to tell a, a, a quick story. I'm not a comedian, I'm not a storyteller, but I've practiced telling the story, so sometimes people like it. The purpose of the story is to talk about noise theory in general, and to maybe give a little bit of a fun, better understanding about noise in general. So here it goes, let me try. Um, about 15 years ago, my wife, Ellen, was pregnant with our first son, Aaron, about 15 years ago. And in the middle of the night, about 2 in the morning, Lee, Lee, wait, wake up. Time to go. Time to go to the hospital. I said, oh, okay, Ellen, all right, we're first, let's go. Let's drive it, get, we're in the United States. We don't have a bus or a train. We have to get in the car to drive to the hospital. We get to the hospital, we walk in, and they take a look at my wife, the doctors and the nurses, and they say, no, 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 first time, First time, mom, you're just nervous. The baby is not ready. Go home. Go home. New England, in, in the New England states, we have a reputation of being a little cold and not real friendly. They say, go home. Get out of the hospital. Okay. We go back home. Get back into bed. A couple of hours later, four in the morning. My wife is saying, we really have to go to the hospital again. We get back in the car. We drive to the hospital. We show up at the hospital, the doctor and the nurse meet us at the door and they say, you again? They're not very friendly. Yes, it's us again and my wife, she's fixed. Okay, all right, we'll take a look at your wife. And sure enough, okay, labor has just started. We will, we will take you into the hospital. Okay. So uh, my wife made me go to the natural childbirth class where we, we do not want the doctors to be involved in the birth, where we just want to have a natural birth. So 24 hours later, one full day later, we are still in the hospital. My wife is still in labor. No baby yet. So the doctor says, Lee, the baby is not doing very well. It's not an emergency, but let's go to the operating room. We're going to take the baby out. We're going to have the cesarean section take the baby out. Put on the white gown and go meet us in the operating room. Okay. 
I put on the clothes and I go down to the operating room and there is my wife lying down on the bed and she's saying, hi, honey, how are you? I said, oh, not as, not as good as you are, but you look like you're doing great. Says, you can name the baby anything that you want. I don't, I don't think so, Ellen, you won't like that very much. <laughs> I know I'll get in big trouble. Let's just wait on what the name of the baby will be. Okay, all right. So the doctors and the nurses, they're working on my wife. They're working, they're working. And then all of a sudden, the doctor says, hey, Lee, take a look. I, I'm an engineer. I know if I see blood, I will fall right over. I don't, I don't want to look. But it's New England. The doctor says, Lee, take a look. Okay. I go, take a look. I don't know what they call the movie in Europe, but any of you have seen the United States movie Alien? <laughs> there is my son's head. My son's head is coming out of my wife's abdomen. This is a birth about to happen. And then everybody in the room gets very, very quiet. The doctor and the nurse and the anesthesiologist and me. And we're all waiting for... We're all waiting for the scream of life. We're all waiting for signal, right? And sure enough, they pull on my son. He comes to life, and he's, he's moving. He's, I'm a first-time dad. I'm crying. I am so happy this kid is he's alive. My son is born. This is wonderful. After he's born, we take him to the hospital room, our room. We get to stay overnight in the room. The hospital lets the dad stay overnight. My son, Aaron... He sleeps like a baby. He's so, he's, he's so tired from screaming his brains out from being born. So we take him home. We leave the hospital. The doctors say, your son is okay. We get back home, and you know what happens for the next nine months? For any of you who have children, every night for nine months, he screams his brains out for nine months. We can't get any sleep, and we go to the doctor. We say, doctor, what is wrong with my baby? What is his problem? The doctor says, he has colic. He is colicky. Doctor, what does that mean? What does it mean, colic, colicky? It means that he cries for no reason, and we don't know why. <laughs> Thanks a lot, doctor. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <clears throat> that screaming in our house for nine months after Aaron was born... That was noise. The only difference between signal and noise is noise is a signal you don't want at a particular place and a particular time. The reason I tell this story is there is no textbook, new textbook on noise that you need to learn. Everything that we know about signals applies to noise. If we understand how signals move from one place to another, if we understand all the signal paths, then we naturally understand all four noise paths, and there's nothing new to learn. We just have to learn a couple of, uh, maybe a couple of uh, different words that describe the same thing, like the baby's crying when, when Aaron was born. That was joy. That was happiness, right? But then when he was home screaming his brains out and not letting us sleep, that was noise. That was a horrible sound, even though it was exactly the same sound. So I want to use that, just that idea about that signals and noise are really the same thing, just the noise is what we don't want at a particular time to talk about the four noise paths. So, for example, so, for example, um, if I am a circuit board designer, and what path do I use to connect circuits from one place to another? What, what do I usually use on a circuit board? Traces. And more general than traces, what else could I call them? Cables. More general than that. Conduct wires, conductors. Yeah, so path number one is called conducted coupling. Okay, conducted coupling. Now, sometimes I, I bet that you will go to somewhere to a different talk in this conference today, and you will hear somebody use a different word, and they mean exactly the same thing as conducted coupling. And sometimes when you're new to a, to a, a scientific area, or when you haven't heard all of the different discussions, sometimes words will come up, and you don't understand what the words mean, but they actually, they're, they're, they have, there are many words used to describe the same thing. Uh, does anybody know 
what conducted coupling is also called. It starts off with common. I'm just going to write down Z for common impedance coupling. Okay? And I want to talk about that for a moment. I want to talk about conducted coupling and common impedance coupling. When I went to school, I was taught how to uh, draw circuits in a very simple way. This is, what I, this is what I went back to school to learn about. I would draw a circuit like this. I would have a source of time-changing current or voltage and a load, and then a complete. I would show a complete loop for that current to flow. So I'm going to draw two of these circuits right now. I'm going to try to create a noise problem. So I'm going to call the circuit on the left the source and the circuit on the right the victim. So source and victim. All right. If I want to create a conducted noise problem between the source and the victim, how many conductors do I need to create a noise problem? One? How many for one, one wire? How many people say two wires? A lot of people not saying anything. Okay, let's, let's make a connection with one wire first. Let's see what happens. Here's one wire, okay? So that red, red line on the bottom, I've connected. I've made, I've made one conductive connection. All right, let's see what happens. A, a noise current tries to flow out of the source. So I've got a noise, of course, there it is, a noise current flowing out of the source. It reaches the victim circuit. Then what happens? It can't get back, can it? If, we, if you paid attention to Maxwell's equations in school, they, they, someone described to you Maxwell's equations, and then hopefully the conservation of uh, charge or the continu uh, continuity of current, which means we can't create or destroy electrons, which means current always flows in a loop, which means current always uh, returns to its source, a lot of engineers in the United States have been doing digital circuit design for a very long time. And what they pay attention to in their digital circuits is voltage versus time. Voltage versus time tells them whether they have a good signal or not. And they have forgotten about current. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in, in classes and in troubleshooting reminding uh, digital engineers to follow the path of current and find the complete loop of current. Okay. So if I have one wire here, there's no way for a current to leave the source, enter the victim, and then return back. Not with one conductor. That is not enough. There are some people uh, back home in the United States, they get very excited about talking about things like single point ground, SPG. They like talking about single point grounds. They're, most of them are not sure why they're excited and think single point grounding is important, but they heard it before and they like to say it. I'm being a little silly, but, but not very much. When people talk about single point grounding correctly, or when they know where that idea came from, what is the basis for that idea, if I allow two circuits to conductively touch only one time in one place, that means I will not have conducted noise coupling. Okay? One connection only means I cannot have conducted coupling. So um, uh, over the years, somebody memorized that, and they talk about single point grounds, single point grounds, because that can be important in some system design to make sure that a current does not flow in a place we don't want. But they, if you ask them to draw a schematic and say, why is single point grounding important, sometimes you will not get a clear, uh, clear answer. Okay? So, uh, so we must, the physical thing, if we're, gonna, if we're going to troubleshoot noise problems, we would like some clues. We'd like to understand why things happen and what physical evidence do we have. So the physical thing we should be looking for then would be two conductive, two conductive connections. Two conductive connections. Now that may mean two actual wires. That might mean two different conductive connections to a current carrying chassis, a current carrying enclosure. So that could be two places where a circuit board attaches to a conductive chassis. That could be a signal return that is connected to a chassis at one end and connected to a chassis at another end with, with a path through an earth grounding, uh, another path through an earth grounding path to provide another return path. So two conductive connections. The electrical thing that I need is obviously we've got to have a current. 
And the other thing that we have to have, um, if I draw this picture again, maybe in a place where you can see a little bit better, if I draw this picture again really quickly, and I have a source and a victim, then if a current flows through the source, what we need is there to be a resistance to cause a voltage drop when that noise current flows uh, through the victim circuit. So we have to have a, a shared resistance right here. So it, we, not only a current, but a, a shared resistance. Can we have conducted coupling at DC? Sure, we, we might call that a, a power bus problem. We might say our power supply voltage is too low. We might be in an old automobile where we turn on the headlights and we see other lights in the vehicle become less bright, they dim, right? So we don't need a time-changing current for conducted coupling. Now, to talk about the other synonym for a second, if you read an application note or a textbook or a web article about conducted coupling, sometimes what people will call conducted coupling they will call it instead common impedance coupling. The secret handshake, the little secret is the shared impedance. That, that's a resistance, but, but don't tell anybody, okay? It's a resistance, okay? So common impedance, actually common impedance coupling ought to be called common resistive coupling because if it's, if it, if it's, not, a, if it's not a shared resistance, we have to call it another path, as we'll find out in a second, okay? That's conducted coupling. Any questions on conducted coupling? That was easy, right? Okay, what's the next path? How else can we get signals from one place to another? No one would like to volunteer? Okay, induction or inductive coupling. How many of you, when you went to college or uh, uh, elementary school or high school, when you went to university, how many of you had a class where the instructor very clearly taught you how to identify physical inductance in a circuit board, cable, or a conductor. Not an inductor that you would buy from Farnell or from DigiKey in the United States, but the inductance that's not on your circuit schematic, but that is built into the circuit board, the cable, or connector. How many of you were taught how to identify physical inductance in school? Everyone understood the question? Yeah. Did everybody see how many hands went up? Okay, there was one hand went up, and that was a professor in the front row. What does that mean? That means if all noise problems are evenly distributed, radiated, radiated uh, emissions, radiated coupling is going to be one of the four, right? We're going to write, this, write that down in a moment. If radiated coupling, if, if all noise problems are evenly distributed among four noise paths, so 25% are conducted, 25% are radiated, 25% are inductive, and 25% are going to be capacitive, that means if you are supposed to troubleshoot a noise problem, you are, and, and it turns out to be an inductive noise problem, here's how you're troubleshooting. You have no idea where the problem is because if you can't find one inductor, then you definitely cannot find two inductors that are magnetically linked, right? If the noise problem is a transformer already on your schematic, that's not a problem. It's right there on your schematic. That's easy, right? You bought that transformer. You built it, right? We're talking about the transformers that, do, that are not on the schematic that are causing a noise problem, okay? But <clears throat> let's say if I, take, um, if I take one piece of wire and I do this, I do this. I go wind, wind, wind like that. And I, and I draw a picture of that. All right, I'm going to put that up at the top of the screen. Somewhere up on the top of the screen here. Okay, so I built one inductor. And I take another piece of wire and I go wind, 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 wind like that. So I'll draw that second one like this. And if I put a time-changing current, right? If I put a time-changing current in the left coil, what do I get at the right coil? I heard current, but I should really hear time-changing voltage. Mr. Faraday would like to hear that, right? A time-changing voltage on the right-hand side, okay? If we want this coupling to happen, if we want this path, if I want to hear my baby scream because he's becoming born, he's being born, what do I call the coil on the left? Primary and the coil on the right, secondary. If I don't want the coupling from the coil on the left, 
to, to travel. I don't want coupling between the coil on the left and the coil on the right. What do we call the coil on the left? We call that the source, and we call the coil on the right the victim. See, there's nothing new. Whether we call it a noise problem or intentional transformer, I think that we should call inductive coupling, I think we should really call it transformer coupling because many people have a physical feeling for what a transformer looks like. They know how to build one. It's not a mystery. But be, the answers that I got in this room are very similar to the answers I get in any classroom situation anywhere in the world. Very few people are being taught how to identify physical inductance in circuits. That means they can't find inductive coupling. I graduated with a, a four-year college degree in the United States. I worked as an EMC engineer for six years, and I could not find inductive coupling because I could not find a physical inductor anywhere. Right? So that, that ought to be something that we should go learn about. I won't be talking about that in this section, but that's how important it is. So inductive coupling, transformer coupling, we might call that H-field coupling or B-field coupling, depending upon who we are. The phys what physical things should we find if we have inductive coupling? What should we be able to find? How many loop? One loop, two loops, or more than two loops? At least two loops, At least two loops right? Otherwise, where is the pr we have to have a primary and we have to have a secondary, right? And the, idea the loops, well, if we understand how current flows from source to load and back, that will help us find the current loops, right? So uh, we need at least, we need two loops. Now they might be multi-turn loops, more that, but that would be unusual. That'd be a very special kind of noise problem. But in general, yeah, two loops. Now if the loops are not moving with respect to each other, if both loops are stationary, then yes, we need a time-changing current to create the, the magnetic field coupling. We need a DIDT to create the time-changing magnetic field, which will pass through the secondary inducive voltage. But what Faraday really meant was he, was, he didn't really talk about the current, he talked about the time-changing magnetic field, right? So we can build motors and generators where something is moving, but we aren't deliberately starting out with a time-changing current. The time-changing current gets, uh, we essentially induce a time-changing voltage because we have a moving magnetic field. Where did that moving magnetic field come from? Either relative motion between the primary and the secondary, or, yeah, a time-changing current if both the source and victim or the primary and the secondary are stationary. Okay, so a DIDT, but really what we're talking about at the victim circuit, a time-changing magnetic field. Okay, all right, so the next path is uh, what? Uh, a time-changing magnetic flux. Yeah, I, I'll agree to that, of course. Um, path number three. Uh, capacitive coupling, right? So we're, uh, I'm going to write in the right-hand side of the, the, the screen here really quick, on the very right, on the right-hand side. Capacitive coupling is often drawn in a very complicated way, but we can draw it much more simply and say that we have a time-changing voltage where the source circuit can see, they can physically see each other, and then over here we have the Thevenin equivalent impedance of the victim circuit. So capacitive coupling, or we can call that uh, electric field coupling, E-field coupling, or we can call that, you know, just electric coupling. We need a time-changing voltage, or again, relative motion, a time-changing electric field in the presence of another plate would, would yield a time-changing current, right? A time-changing current is going to be induced into the victim circuit. So the physical thing we need for capacitive coupling uh, if it's not on the schematic, it's a noise problem. So we, we, we didn't know we were going to have it. It's not on our circuit schematic. We, 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 we open up the cover of our electronic product. We, we don't see two big parallel lines. We don't, we don't see the, the, the capacitor symbol, right? We, we, that would be too easy. That would be great if all noise problems were that easy, right? Somebody draws in the two, two loops. They say, here is the source and the victim. No. Two line, so we're going to be looking for two conductive surfaces. So two conductive surfaces. One might be flat, one might be round, they don't have to look the same. That everyone has memorized the concept of capacitance as a parallel plate capacitor. When I say parallel plate capacitor, uh, in, the, in the United States, people see two parallel lines like that. 
when people are old or they're from Europe, they see this, right? But they still see two, and, and most capacitive noise coupling is not that simple, right? We don't have two parallel lines. But if it was in a cable, we'd have two parallel wires, right? If we designed a circuit board, maybe not perfectly, and we had signal traces on adjacent layers, and, the, and those traces were right on top of each other, we could visualize some capacitive coupling, okay? Now, the fourth path, finally, what we came here for is called radiative coupling. What are, what are some other words that describe radiative coupling? What do EMC engineers call radiative coupling? Anybody? Electromagnetic, okay? That makes physicists very mad because to them, all energy transfer is electromagnetic. But EMC engineers, we no, don't listen to the physics guys. It's, it's, it's a le when we mean, when we don't mean conductive, when we don't mean inductive coupling where we're paying attention to just H or, or total flux, time changing flux, and we're not talking about just capacitive coupling where we're looking at time changing electric flux. When we say we have both electric and magnetic flux, that's what we call electromagnetic. But the other words that you will hear at this conference and in the exhibition floor, you'll hear people talking about far field coupling. You'll hear people talking about plane wave coupling. And for, for EMC design and troubleshooting, those mean the same thing. There's no distinction. There are not 62 or 88 or 35 or 14 noise coupling paths, despite what all the application notes say. There are only four. And any one noise problem at one frequency, probably a combination of three at most. Okay, uh, what's the driving, what's the source, what, what is, what's the electrical thing the electrical thing that we must have for radiative coupling. Anybody? If we look at Maxwell's equations, we'll find, we'll find a J in there, and I'm just gonna call that a time-changing current. We've gotta have a vector source to create that vector field at a, different, at a distance, right? Okay, so we need uh, the physical, and what's the physical thing that, we, if we have a radiated coupling problem, what do we have to find? How many antennas? It's always two of everything, right? If you're troubleshooting a noise problem, there's always two touches, there's two surfaces, there's two loops, or there's two antennas. Right, a transmitting antenna, two antennas. A, a transmitting antenna, a TX, and an RX. For regulatory testing, and you, if you pay money for a test laboratory, an EMI test laboratory, if they are measuring radiated emissions for you, they're providing the receiving antenna. If they're measuring radiated emissions for you, they are providing the, a transmitting antenna in a field. Your product for radiated emissions is providing the transmitting antenna. Your product for radiated immunity is providing the receiving antenna. In many cases, your product's antennas will provide, both radi will provide the path for both radiated emissions and radiated immunity. Right? What's different is the circuit inside of your product. There might be one circuit causing the radiated emissions problem, one of the ones I mentioned before, the, the, the digital signal, the switch mode power supply, the motor drive, the whatever, providing the source. There might be a very different uh, part of the system responding or receiving the noise, causing the radiated immunity problem. The antenna structure might be the same, but it's a different circuit that's sensitive to noise as compared to the circuit that's producing the noise, right? So the path is the same, but actually the place on the circuit board that we look at and try and understand the problem could be totally different. Hope that makes sense. Okay, any questions on the four noise paths? Okay, how many of, for, how, for, for this audience, how many of you were very comfortable and could have done that slide yourself? That was very easy. How many of you were very confident of that before you walked in the room? Don't be shy. Okay, about half, and then there's some smiles, a couple of people smiling, I know they should be raising their hands, okay. All right, now we're gonna, take, now we're gonna talk a little bit, just use a tiny bit of math. It's gonna be silly, but it's gonna be easy. <clears throat> The point of this slide is to try to provide a little bit of understanding behind what, what's different uh, uh, between the inductive coupling, the capacitive coupling, and the far field coupling. Ideally, I would have a bunch of demonstrations here, 
uh, but because I arrived so late, I am not ready to do those demonstrations. So we're going to talk about them and, and have fun with them anyway. All right. Um, many people, when they went to school for electromagnetics or antennas, we had a, we had a, um, you might have had an excellent electromagnetics instructor. Maybe you had one who, who was not so excellent. There was one class that I had that, that was, I wish was better, and I like to relive that class and teach it a different way. So in most electromagnetics books or antenna classes, they talk about a little piece of current, a current density J, that's turning on and off and on and off, and it's located somewhere at X, Y, and Z. And then the whole point of the lecture, and maybe a horrible homework problem later, is to derive the math to tell you about how strong, what, what should that radio wave feel like at some distance, at some radial distance R, okay? So um, the whole purpose is to, the whole purpose of the homework problem or the, the lecture is to describe how does that radio wave feel at a distance, okay? So what, that's what I wanna talk about right now. But I wanna, instead of having this be just math, I wanna make it a physical thing. So I'm gonna pretend that instead of sitting at observation point P, I'm gonna pretend that I'm in my car back at home, okay? Here's my beautiful car and here is the FM radio antenna sticking up out of my car. Okay. So somewhere in my car there's some mast antenna sticking up out of the car like that. And I'm listening to two different radio stations in my car. And I'm pushing the buttons to radio station A and radio station B. And I'm a noise geek, right? I like pushing A and B and I like looking at the signal strength of radio station A and radio station B. Let's talk about those two radio stations for a second. Let's pretend those two radio stations are both located in Dresden. And we have radio station A and radio station B. <clears throat> radio station A is, um, is uh, classical music from Beethoven. 100,000 watts of delightful music. 100,000 watts. Okay, radio station B uh, which, which we don't listen to too much, is one million watts of pop music. Pop, 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 pop. One million watts of power, okay? So you can listen to Beethoven, or you can listen to the other thing, all right? Both of these radio stations are located exactly on the same street in Dresden. They have the same antenna tower, they have the same antenna, okay? Now I'm back in my car. Who has the stronger signal? radio station B, right? It has more power. If I were to climb up the tower, the radio tower of radio station B, and then climb up the tower of radio station A, and I were to measure the current, because I would expect an EMC engineer to have a current probe, right? You all can use current probes. It would be very helpful to find antenna current, right? So I put my current probe around the antenna of radio station B. I, I climb down the tower, go to radio station A. Who has more current on the antenna? B, right? More power into the same load, radio station B. And radio station B is stronger. So what you're telling me is the strength of the radio wave at a distance R, the strength of the radio wave it must be proportional to current, right? Because current is going to be proportional to, you know, I squared is going to be proportional to power, right? At either radio station. So if there's more current, there's a stronger field, right? That's the vector source that's creating the vector field, the E or the H, okay? What happens if I drive away from Dresden? If I drive back to Frankfurt towards the next airport in my life? <laughs> do, does, does the radio stations A and B, do they get, does the signal get stronger, weaker, or stay the same? It gets weaker, right? So that means it's the, the radio wave strength is inversely proportional to R, right? The distance vector. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> But that math is not complicated enough, right? If we were to go look in the electromagnetics book or the antenna book, there would be more than that, right? This, this, this problem is in one dimension, right? We have three-dimensional people, three-dimensional antennas. So without any proof, I'm just going to say there must be another term with R squared. And in general, there could also be a term that includes R cubed. So I'm going to write a J over R cubed here as well for both, for both, uh, both the electric field and the magnetic field, J over R squared and J over R cubed, okay? But 
for those of you who are university professors, I must be missing something here. There is, the, the, if this was all there was to the math, we would have all gotten uh, the best grade point average, straight A's. We would, have, we would have liked electromagnetics and signed up for as many electromagnetics courses as possible. What's missing? What's, what's missing? There's got to be some information about the medium. What is the radio wave traveling through? Is it traveling through air or water or plastic? There must be something about the geometry, the size of the antenna, the shape of the antenna. There must be something about phase. There must be beta. There must be something about frequency and wavelength, lambda. There must be del. There must be grad. There must be well, let's just, let's just get it over with, right? Why don't we just write in here the entire Greek alphabet? Okay? There. Now we have the full solution for the electromagnetic fields at point P. Now I'm being very sloppy. I'm, being, I'm making big shortcuts here, right? To make it simple. All right? So we're, 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 in, the, we're, in, the, we're in, in my car here, and we're in Dresden, and now we're driving away from Dresden. So what, what I'm saying is, what happens as we get, we're going to drive away from Dresden, what happens, as, what happens as the magnitude of R, our distance vector, gets big? What happens as separation distance gets big? Well, R cubed blows up, right? R cubed gets enormous, right? Anything over R cubed, including the entire Greek alphabet, when R gets really big, that term has to go to zero, right? Okay, that's zero. Same thing for this R cubed term. What happens when R gets very big? What happens to R squared? This whole term has to go to zero. This term goes to zero. I drive away from Dresden. After a little while, the only thing I hear, the only thing my FM radio listens to is this. What do we call that? That must be the far field. Exactly. That's what we mean by the far field. That's what we're talking about with radiative coupling, right? All right. If that's the far field, what do you think we call this stuff over here on the right? That must be the near field. That's, that's the stuff that we measure when we use <laughs> sniffing probes. When we put a probe very close to a circuit board or a cable, a connector, and we see a lot of things on our spectrum analyzer or a measurement receiver, we see a lot of stuff, right, in the near field. That doesn't mean that there's a far field. What that means is the circuit is turned on, right? That means there's a time-changing current, a time-changing voltage. We have to step away a distance with an antenna to see what the far field looks like. That's the near field. But we do use the near field to help you know, to help identify the location of sources, right? Our near field probes, if we take one of our near field probes, probes and, we're, um, and we start sniffing around a circuit board, what happens when we move the near field probe away from the circuit board? If I was doing this demonstration right now, if I put it right close to my circuit board, you'd see all these digital lines. When I move the probe you know, a small distance away, we'd see nothing, right? Why, why would I see nothing? It's still, the circuit's still turned on, right? Why is the probe picking up nothing? What do we call physical things that measure the far field? We call them antennas, right? And antennas have certain properties. They, have, they usually have physical size compared to the wavelength they're trying to measure, right? right? So usually our near-field probes are going to be miserable antennas mostly because of their size. Now, they might be shielded so that I only measure electric field, or they, uh, sorry, so I only measure magnetic field, right? Or they might be designed with just a very small surface area, so they, they try to measure just electric field, right? So near field, we use near field probes to troubleshoot noise problems to, to identify the source, but they might not tell me exactly what's happening far away. So when we talk about radiated emissions, we're, we're talking about that, that one over R stuff, right? Okay, so in general, if it's a solution to a, a, to a source, if, if in the most general solution we have R, R squared, and R cubed, what we're talking about is the fourth noise path, radiative coupling or electromagnetic coupling, when we're far enough away, just the one over R terms dominate, right? Of course, the question is, is how far? How far do we have to be um, to say that, oh, to, to be in, like in my car driving away from Dresden when I only hear one over R? How 
how far. In other words, what do I need to compare the separation distance to? How big is big enough to say I'm in the far field? When I need to look for antennas, which will have physical size, which will usually be easy to identify in a troubleshooting situation, in a design situation, I will know what structures are big enough to cause a radiated emissions or immunity problem because we need large objects usually. So what's the separation distance? Generally speaking, greater than or equal to one, I'll write it in the right, my slide's getting pretty messy now, one wavelength, one lambda, okay? What, what does that physically mean? What does one lambda mean? If I'm listening to, let's say, 100, 100 megahertz FM radio signal in air, separation, dis, the, the, the wavelength is three meters, right? So that means source and victim, three meters or more apart, we would call that far field coupling, right? I need big objects to cause far field coupling. I would need antennas of a certain size to cause that, okay? What if it, why does this matter? Well, if I start doing crazy automotive or military emissions tests, how far away do they place the measurement antenna? Very close, right? They place it one meter away. That means at frequencies, uh, at frequencies uh, below uh, 300 megahertz, where wavelength and air is one meter, at frequencies below 300 megahertz, where the measurement antenna and the, and the circuit we're listening to are less than a wavelength apart, that means that small little objects can cause trouble. We don't look for big antennas anymore. If you think about an audio transformer, the, kinds that we, the kind that we used to use to connect to the telephone network for modems, right? or audio transformers that we used to use in analog audio amplifiers. They were tiny, they could fit in the palm of your hand, right? But the wavelengths of the signals that were moving from primary to secondary were measured in hundreds of kilometers, right? Kilohertz signals. So we were able to magnetically couple a gigantic wavelength, a huge wavelength from primary to secondary with a very small object. That's, that's what happens in near field coupling. In far field coupling, that transformer is not going to do anything. It's not going to be an efficient antenna, right? So this, this, this very simplified, maybe you think kind of sloppy math, it gives tremendous insight into troubleshooting radiated emissions problems. Because if, if we're going to pay attention to, if we're going to try to find the cause of the radiated emission, the structure, if the antenna really is a wavelength or more away, we're looking for big structures that are a, a, good, a significant fraction of a wavelength, right? But if we're, if we're looking at frequencies where the wavelengths are, 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 are large compared to the separation distance, then, then we're in the near field and very small objects can cause trouble. Completely different troubleshooting idea, okay? That, that's one of the ways I use this, um, I use the, the simplified math, why I keep it in my head. So separation distance greater than a wavelength, we're in the far field. Separation distance less than a wavelength, we're in the near field. Now, occasionally you'll read in a textbook, you'll hear somebody talking about uh, the, 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 the definition of the distance that separates near field from far field is lambda, a wavelength, divided by 2 pi, lambda divided by 6, right? Well, if you take a look at where does that come from, when people derive that or they point to that, when people point to that, they forgot where it, got, where it came from, where it's derived from. That's when the 1 over r squared terms, the, these terms here, equal the 1 over, one over r cubed terms. That, that, that doesn't necessarily say the 1 over r terms are dominant. It only talks about these two terms over there. The far field is where this stuff, the 1 over r terms, are dominant. Okay, so for practical troubleshooting, um, I use uh, separation distance of a wavelength. <clears throat> now, some, if, if we're working on a digital system, we're working on radiated emissions from a digital system, there will be many wavelengths. Which wavelength do you choose? The wavelength that corresponds to the frequency that you're worried about, right? So it, it may not always be this simple. Okay, any questions about near field, far field? So the, what, what on the previous slide, we talked about the four noise paths. What does the near field apply to? Inductive and capacitive coupling, right? That's what we mean by the near field components. And if we try to multiply one of the E terms that, that depend on R squared times one of the H terms that depends on R squared or one of the H terms that depends on R cubed, if we try to multiply those together and get a power, we'll, we'll get the letter I or the letter J in front, meaning it's a reactive power. We're not losing that power to space, we're getting it right back, right? The far field, we're losing that power to space, it's never coming back. 
right? Far field means outgoing waves only. We're not getting that energy, that power back. Okay. No questions? Okay. So here's some near field probes that we use. Those were fun to look at. Okay. So we'll to quickly talk about types of emissions. Um, very briefly, if we have a radiated emission from a product, maybe the antenna is a cable. Some portion of a cable is important. Maybe the, some portion of the enclosure is important. Maybe the enclosure is made out of different pieces of metal and are not well connected. Uh, maybe the circuit board is acting like one portion of an antenna. Um, we use an antenna in radiated emissions to detect the presence of the electric field or the magnetic field at a distance. Most of the MI tests tell us to measure the electric field, because they do. There's a few that tell us to measure the magnetic field. Um, and then the other emissions tests, AC or DC power line conducted emissions tests, are usually at, at lower frequencies. Uh, we use some sort of weird circuit to, to detect the noise current flowing out of the power connection or sometimes the network connection of the system. Um, but most importantly, I would just say is that radiated emissions always start as a current as a current. So we use current probes to try to find the biggest current on the best looking antenna that's causing a radiated emission. If we're thinking about radiated immunity, if I could find the biggest current at the noise frequencies that seem to be upsetting my system, that would be a good path to troubleshooting, right? But um, in conducted emissions, as we'll see, we're not most of the time we're not directly measuring current, we're detecting the voltage caused by that current. But radiated emissions start as a current so we can use Near, field, near magnetic field probes or, or you know, shaped in a particular way a current probe to detect that current. If we know how big the current is, we can predict how big the field will be. There should be a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you're troubleshooting a radiated emissions problem and you've got a current probe measuring a current on a cable somewhere or on a piece of metal and you're on the right, the correct antenna, the dominant antenna, there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the current on that cable, wire, piece of metal, whatever that antenna structure is, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the amplitude of that current and the amplitude of the received field, right? That's what the math said, that E and H were proportional to J. That's what Maxwell said, you got a vector source, you got a vector field, the vector field's caused by the vector source, okay? Radiated emissions always start as a current. Okay, everybody's having fun? Okay, good, all right. All right, um, just a quick survey. Um, <clears throat> Here's, a, here's a, an electronic product, and it's sitting on a table, and depending upon which test we're, which type of radiated emissions test we're using, maybe we will rotate the product, maybe we won't. We'll measure it with some weird-looking antenna, and then we'll listen to it with a test receiver or a spectrum analyzer. So I just want to really quickly take a look at this parameter on the left-hand side where you see uh, what is the separation distance equal to? Is it a stupid test distance? Now, what does that mean, stupid? Test distance isn't alive, it can't be dumb. What about the choice of the test distance? In other words, is the test distance smaller than a wavelength at some of the frequencies we are supposed to measure? <clears throat> and, um, well, let's see. Uh, in commercial tests where we use a three, or in the US we like to use three meters and cover our eyes, right? But if we use a three or 10 meter test distance, well, that translates to, a 10 meter test distance uh, translates to uh, one wavelength at 30 megahertz. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for your interest in this uh, session about uh, EMC fundamentals.